a TED Talk recently. Your brain plus the cloud equals superhumans. A Google engineer predicts nanocomputers connected to the cloud will be implanted in our brains by 2030. 2030 is not that far away. This is frightening. To explain, nanocomputers implanted in our brains that connect to the cloud will usher in a new era of critical thinking and human advancement, Google's director of engineering predicts in a TED Talk. Ray Kurzweil says that by the 2030s, nanobots embedded through the bloodstream into our brains will create hybrid minds that combine the current power of our brain with the almost limitless processing capacity of cloud-based computers. These microcomputers will help us get quick answers to complex problems and will provide the extra juice needed to come up with creative ideas. Ah, but question here. Notice, the current power of our brain with the almost limitless processing capacity of cloud-based computers? Who, wh where's the limitless processing capacity? I thought our brains were unlimited, right? That's how God designed them. And here they're saying that our brains are limited, but computers are unlimited. I don't know about that. Elon Musk wants to connect computers to your brain so we can keep up with robots. Everyone know who Elon Musk is? Yeah, the famous developer of technology, SpaceX, Tesla, and all these big companies. Connect computers to your brain so we can keep up with robots. <laughs> Who's keeping up with who here? I really don't fancy trying to act like a robot, honestly. With the help of brain implants that are directly linked to computers, humans may be able to improve their brain function or even one day upload their thoughts or download the thinking of others. Question here, though. I mean, back to the, the robots issue. Who controls the robot? The robot or the person who programmed the robot? Right. We do have artificial intelligence now, and I, I, I know that, you know, they can come up with things on their own, supposedly, but no matter how independent this robot seems, somebody designed it to begin with. How does that, and I mean, do you see where the implications of this are going? This idea of uploading our thoughts or downloading the thinking of others. It's not spelled out this way, but just think about it. Who's controlling the mind of the human here? The human or those nanobots implanted in the bloodstream? Don't have any thoughts of your own? No problem, just download someone else's thinking. How does that line up with what we know from Christian leadership? God has given men talents, which he means they should use. He has given them minds, and he means they should become thinkers and do their own thinking and planning. Not allowing someone else's thinking and planning, their own thinking and planning, rather than depend upon others to think and plan for them. Now, let me clarify. I don't mean to suggest that this is the future of the world and soon everyone will be controlled by a select few officials through nanobots in our brains. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, I'm saying it's way worse than that. <laughs> you see, Satan has been working on mind control for a very long time, way before Elon Musk ever came up with the idea. And if we think cloud-based thinking is how he's going to control us, we've really missed the real mind control. And in fact, thinking is already at an all-time low. A recent study found more than 80% of employers said recent graduates were deficient in critical thinking. 80%. That's really, really scary, actually. Now, psychologists tell us that less than half of the population are even capable of engaging in what we know as formal reasoning, you know, good thinking abilities. Less than half of us. Well, that's who many are, how many are capable, but what we also know is that only about 5% of us actually employ this ability that we have. 5% of us critical thinkers. How many here are thinkers? Raise your hand. That's too many. <laughs> 5%. Now, I hope there's more than 5% than here that are good thinkers, but this is the trend in our society. This is the direction that it is going. Decreased thinking skills. Is that because of the nanobots that are in our brains right now? No, we don't have those yet. How are we having decreased thinking skills? I think Satan's up to something, is he not? Before we get, though, into how Satan is damaging good thinking skills, let's ask ourselves the question, so what? Is it that big of an issue 
that we have a decrease in thinking skills. We've seen 80% are deficient, 95% according to this, either way, very low. Uh, is that a big problem? Well, let's look at a little bit out of the spirit of prophecy and the Bible. We read in the book Gospel Workers that moral purity depends on right thinking. Moral purity. Do we want to be morally pure? Do we want our young people to grow up morally pure and our children to make morally pure decisions? What does it depend on? Well, it says right here, on right thinking. More than that, we're told that young men must be trained up to be thinkers. So not only does moral purity depend on it, but it should be part of the educational process, evidently. And thirdly, God calls upon everyone with whom he works to do the very highest kind of thinking. Moral purity depends on it. It should be part of education. And if we want to work with the Lord, we need to be thinkers. We saw a moment ago, God has given men talents. Why? He wants us to use them. He's given us minds. Why? So that we can do our own thinking and not depend on someone else to think and plan for us. But really, at the heart of the matter is a beautiful quotation found in the book Education, page 17. Every human being created in the image of God is endowed with a power akin to that of the Creator. Akin. What does this word mean? Like. Similar to. Exactly. Every one of us. Are we all humans here? All right. I think this applies to all of us here. Every human being created in the image of God, we've been created in the image of God, I'll get into more of that in a later session, is endowed with a power like our Creator. We have been given a power that our Creator has. What is this? Well, it continues to tell us what it is. Individuality, power to think and to do. And this explains to us the type of thinking we're discussing this morning. When we're talking about thinking skills and the decline in thinking skills, you may be thinking of, uh, you know, PhDs or these really smart people. That's not necessarily the type of thinking that the Lord has called us to do. I've actually met plenty of PhDs who were not very good thinkers. <laughs> that's no, nothing wrong with the PhDs, but that's no guarantee of good thinking skills. What is the type of thinking that the Lord has asked us to do? The key is that word individuality. He wants us to be independent thinkers. Independent in the sense that we know why we believe what we believe, we can base it on the Word of God, and we can stand for it though the heavens fall. Though the entire world around us says that we're wrong, we can think for ourselves and know that our belief is based on the Word of God. You realize we're going to come to that in this earth's history. We're going to come to a time where we feel like we are the only person on this earth who is standing for the truth. We need the power of independent thinking. And we're, we're told that the men in whom this power is developed are the ones who bear responsibilities, who lead in enterprise, and who influence character. Do you want your child to be a leader, to grow up to be a leader, to grow up to bear responsibilities, to influence others rather than merely being influenced, as so many are today? How can we do this? Well, it is the work of true education to develop this power. What power? The power of independent thought. To train the youth to be what? Say it with me. Thinkers and not mere reflectors of other men's thought. When I read that as an educator and a teacher, I said, that's exactly what the problem is. We have an educational system and a society in general that is training our young children all the way up through their youth to merely reflect what someone else has told them, to study what someone else has told them, remember it long enough to put it down on a test, to reflect what they see on television or in the media. We could go on down the list in society in general we are training reflectors and not thinkers. And yet we're told that in times of discouragement and darkness, how important to have calm thinking men who are not dependent on circumstances, but who trust God and labor on in the darkness as well as the light. Will we soon have times of discouragement and darkness? Absolutely we will. How are we going to resist? How are we going to stand in those times? Thinking, a major important part there independent thinking, the type of thinking we discussed a moment ago. But really, our, our power of thought goes beyond just our ability to work for the Lord or the academic or the practical skills. It goes right to the heart of personal spirituality and right to the heart of spiritual success in the last days. What do I mean by that? Well, the end time battle is a battle over who has control over our mind. Turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to the book of Revelation. We're just going to look at a couple of verses and illustrate to us the fact that the end-time battle is a battle over who has control over your mind. 
Revelation chapter 7. These are a couple of verses that we know quite well. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. John says, I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. The angel had what? The seal of God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God, where? In their foreheads. Where? In their foreheads. What do you think this forehead represents? The frontal lobe, that decision-making area of our brain, the seat of independent thought in our brain. You, I hope you realize this is not a rubber stamp that's placed on our forehead that everyone can look at. <laughs> this is symbolic to represent that God's people have chosen to follow Him. They would rather die than not follow God. They are independent thinkers, and God says, I can place my seal on their minds. But is God the only one that wants to place His seal upon our minds? Indeed, He's not. Turn a couple chapters over, Revelation 14. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9. The third angel followed, speaking of the mark of the beast here, the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship whom? The beast or his image and receive his mark, where? In his forehead or in his hand, which is an interesting distinction because the Lord wants us to choose to follow him. He will not force our obedience. The devil also goes for our mind, for that frontal lobe, placing his seal on the forehead, but if he can't get us there, he'll try to attack the, the hand, meaning our actions. He'll go for our thoughts first, just like the Lord does, but if he doesn't succeed there, he'll try to get our actions. Uh, but I find it quite, uh, quite important to us that the end time battle is a battle over where the seal, or who places the seal upon our minds. The seal is placed on our mind either way. The question is which seal? The end time battle is a battle over who has control of their mind, of our mind. Um, Romans, turn with me to Romans. We read this verse uh, this morning in my mom's talk. Romans, by the way, that is my mom and not my wife. <laughs> There's been confusion about that occasionally. <laughs> Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. We're told not to be conformed to the world. Now, if the Bible tells us not to do something, what do you think Satan is going to try to do? Well, get us to do it, right? <laughs> He's going to go against it. Okay, so we, again, we have a battle here. So the Lord is saying, don't be conformed to this world. Satan is going to say, be conformed to this world. How do we avoid being conformed to the world? Well, it tells us right here, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We can look all through the Bible. Isaiah tells us, come, let us reason together. Uh, you know, God really wants us to use our minds. In 1 Peter 1.13, we read, uh, he tells us, wherefore, in light of the end times and preparing yourself, gird up the loins of your mind, he says. Now, in ancient times, when you girded up, what were you getting ready to do? Run or fight a battle? Action. We're fighting a battle in the last days, and Peter says, gird up, strengthen your mind. We read that the warfare in which we are engaged is largely mental. We are fighting a battle over the mind. We read that our young people, this comes from the book messages to young people, God knows that they, our young people, will have to battle against the powers of darkness that do what? Strive to gain control over the human mind. It is a battle for the mind. But it was the historian Carter G. Woodson that put it so well. As he looked at history and what made people tick, what made people do what they did, he said, when you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. Do you think the devil knows this? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely he does. That is why he is going for our minds, so that he can control our actions. It was a famous leader who once said, how fortunate for leaders that men do not think. <laughs> who do you suppose wrote this? Adolf Hitler. I'm not going to get into any politics in the United States right now, but we just may be seeing history repeating, eh? <laughs> How fortunate for leaders that men do not think. 
we want to be thinkers. It is the special work of Satan in these last days to take possession of the minds of youth. How important that we have strong minds. Have we seen that clearly? You know, remember I said we've seen thinking at an all-time low, yet we need to ask ourselves the question, before we look at how thinking has got to that point, we need to ask ourselves the question, is it even important that we have good thinking minds? Is it? Have we seen that it is? Absolutely it is. So now let us transition into what the devil is doing to damage our thinking abilities. How is he damaging our minds? Right, we haven't gotten to the, the nanobots implanted in our brains yet, so what is he doing? Well, we read that close reasoners and logical thinkers are few. Now, we've seen that from the research already, like 5%, very few. Why? Well, for the reason that false influences have checked the development of the intellect. Now, checked, what does this word mean? That's an old English term. We don't use it so much. It's not writing a check. <laughs> this is a different form of checked. What is it? Stopped. Stopped, blocked, held back. Exactly. So, false influences have held back the development of the intellect. Now, if we're speaking of development, we're likely speaking of childhood. That is a time in which the, the intellect is developing very quickly often. So, something is going on that is holding back the development of the intellect. And this morning, we're going to look at 10 ways in which the devil is holding back the development of the intellect. 10 thought-destroying tactics. Now, I, I should just mention for those of you who are saying, you know, I've heard this material before. You absolutely have. This is a message that I've given several times. You may have seen it on DVDs. Um, but as I've continued on in research, which we will get to a lot of new research throughout this weekend that I've done recently, um, but we always have to go back to the foundation. And this is really the foundation of how the devil is attacking the brain. And we'll get m more, again, more into... Um, different areas throughout the weekend, but we have to lay the foundation here. So we're going to start with 10 thought-destroying tactics of the devil. Tactic number one is a lack of physical activity. Now you're saying, hang on, uh, here we're talking about the brain, and you're saying I need to go exercise? Indeed. <laughs> we know that exercise is absolutely critical for children. And in fact, we know that uh, for the young child, physical activity is more important than time spent studying. Psychologists tell us, developmentalists tell us, if you have a limited amount of time, you can either spend some time outside or go hit the books. They said, send your child outside. They'll actually learn better for the time they were able to spend outside. Now, part of the reason for that is an area of the brain known as the cerebellum. The cerebellum is linked with the higher frontal levels in the brain. Uh, the cerebellum has an unusually, a disproportionately high number of neurons. It is very concentrated, it, and it reaches out through all of the brain and connects with some very important areas of the brain, including those frontal levels, those decision-making areas of the brain. Very connected, very important. It also deals with the ability to perform repetitive activities automatically, like handwriting, deals with many cognitive skills, language skills, social interaction skills, music, and attention. Have any of you used your cerebellum yet today? <laughs> I hope we've all used our cerebellum. Uh, does anyone want their children to have an underdeveloped cerebellum? Certainly not. This is a very important brain area. How can we help the cerebellum to develop well? Very simple. Movement is absolutely necessary for the development of the cerebellum. And when I say movement, that's whole body activity, particularly that found in the great outdoors. We know that fresh air and sunshine really feed into this also. Uh, but different activities all help develop the cerebellum. We find that rocking for an infant, the back and forth motion, helps the cerebellum develop. Crawling, you know, toddlers, what do they do before they walk? Most begin crawling. The Lord knew that that was beneficial for the development of the cerebellum. Spinning and hanging upside down. You know, kids love to do these things, and we adults don't enjoy it so much. <laughs> it's actually good for their brains. And we now know that the, um, the fluid in the semicircular canals of the ear is very thin and watery in childhood, so they actually don't get dizzy as much as adults do. Again, the Lord knew it was good for their brains. Dr. Jane Healy, I'm going to quote from her several times throughout the weekend. She has some fantastic research, one of the eminent educational researchers and educational psychologist in the United States. She's written many books. And speaking of physical activity, she tells us that after birth, physical activities are one of the child's main means of advancing physical, intellectual, and emotional growth. 
So you should encourage many forms of body movement. Now, I find it very fascinating. What three areas of growth did she name here? Physical, intellectual, and emotional. We know from the spirit of prophecy that there are three areas of education, the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. Here is a secular researcher that does not know the spirit of prophecy telling us physical, intellectual, and emotional. Basically, in the secular terms, that's physical, mental, and spiritual. And she's saying that we should encourage many forms of body movement to help those areas develop. Now, there are many different activities we can do. And, and, and many of them, most of them are good if it's a whole body activity. Would anyone like to guess though, what is the best form of physical activity for the young child? Walking is the best form of exercise, yes, we are told that. But in terms of a whole body activity, a manual training, if you will, what would it be? What was it? Gardening, did I hear? Running? Running's good too. Gardening. We're told in child guidance that no line of manual training is of more value than agriculture. Why so? Well, I'll tell you in a later session. It is powerful for learning. Point number two, overstimulation. We know that uh, the overloading of young children with too many toys, too much in their schedule, or too much school can begin to overwhelm the brain. It begins to shut off the learning, actually. The brain doesn't develop as well because uh, essentially what's going on inside the brain is this. <laughs> it just can't handle the bombardment of stimulation. And we actually know that uh, with regard to toys, the more toys that a child has, the more bored they are, research shows. And you're going, hang on a second. <laughs> well, if there's always something new to go to, they don't learn to develop their powers of attention. They don't need to focus for a longer period of time. And so less toys actually encourages the powers of attention, and they're not as bored. Uh, too much in the schedule. I, I probably don't have to explain that, but we see that so very commonly now. There's school, and there's homework, and there's dance, and there's music, and there's swimming, and there's, uh, you know, on down the list. And kids are just cram-packed. Their days are so full. And of course, too much school. We've seen that really ramped up. I'll talk about that in a later session also. We know the overstimulation is linked to stress, to the danger response in the brain, overactivity, frustration, irritability, and of course, superficial thinking. If you're noticing some of these symptoms in your child, there's a good indicator that they may be experiencing an overstimulated environment. And of course, we run into that in education as we bombard children with different activities and different learning environments that often are not connected to each other. As this explains quite well, the bell will ring just when they're engulfed in learning about the solar system to tell them it's time to start learning how to dissect a sentence. A child learns that no subject is truly meaningful or interesting and therefore learns not to be truly interested in anything meaningful. Sounds familiar, eh? Children need that time to just think and explore. And in fact, we're told in the book Child Guidance that the more quiet and simple the life of the child, quiet and simple, the more free from what kind of excitement? Artificial excitement. And the more in harmony with nature, the more favorable it is to physical and mental vigor and spiritual strength. There's those three areas again. Point number three, too much study. Now, the young people love it when I talk about this one. <laughs> study is a good thing, though, is it not? But can we have too much of a good thing? Absolutely. We know that our time should be balanced between the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. That's very clear in the spirit of prophecy. What happens as we pile on too much study? Well, we begin to, sorry, this, <laughs> that slide should say too much study, not overstimulation. We begin to see learned helplessness, shutting off, superficial learning, burnout, many illnesses, and learning disabilities, all as a result of simply too much time in the classroom. Benny, in fact, actually, I'll, I'll save that for a point later. I'll get to that in just a moment. Point number four, testing. Testing uh, is, is not exactly encouraging good learning. And often we focus on what in the U.S. we call standardized testing. Do you call that the same thing here in New Zealand? It's, it's the government testing that all students take? Standardized testing? Okay, I see some heads nodding. So it, it's the standard government testing. Everyone takes the same test. And most teachers will agree that that is just not very helpful for learning. But even beyond a standardized testing, the whole environment that we now see in the classroom of just constantly bombarding children with assessments, they always have to be assessed, always have to be tested, always a quiz to see how they are, where they're doing, that's really not good for thinking skills, it's not encouraging good learning abilities. And uh, well illustrating this is a parable known as uh, the animal school. For a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. 
who's going to do well on the test? The monkey. Who's going to fail? The fish, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Is that a fair test? No. But do we do the same thing in education today? I'm afraid we do. You see, the, as the story goes, once upon a time, the animals decided they needed to do something to meet the demands of the new world. So they organized a school. They adopted an activity curriculum that consisted of four subjects. They had running, climbing, swimming, and flying. Running, climbing, swimming, and flying. So to make it easier to administer the curriculum, all the animals took all the subjects. They were all highly motivated. They all wanted to learn, so they all tried very hard. Well, the duck was excellent in swimming and flying. In fact, he was better than his instructor. But he lagged behind his classmates in running and climbing, so he had to stay after school and also drop swimming in order to practice those two subjects. Well, soon his webbed feet were badly worn from running, that now he was only average in swimming. The squirrel, I, I'm, I know we don't have those here in New Zealand. Can we use possum? I think that would be pretty close. Uh, the, the possum or the squirrel, he was first in his class in climbing and running and second only to the duck at flying. But the difference with the flying was that he developed some pretty serious frustration issues in the, in the flying class because his teacher made him start from the ground up and he wanted to go from the treetop down. He developed Charlie her horses from overexertion and caught pneumonia in swimming class. So he missed so much school that he got a C in climbing and a D in running. Now, to make matters even worse, because this squirrel constantly squirmed and chattered in class and had difficulty paying attention, he was diagnosed with a learning disorder. The squirrel eventually was placed in remedial classes and had to be medicated in order to continue his schoolwork. I think we call that Ritalin. <laughs> the rabbit started at the top of his class in running, but had a nervous breakdown because of so much makeup work in swimming. Well, the fox... Uh, do you have foxes here? I don't think so. It's a dog, a small dog, wild animal. Uh, he was natural in his running class and scored very well in climbing and in swimming, as you can imagine most dogs would. But flying? He uh, got some pretty bad grades in flying class, and so he actually became so frustrated that he started assaulting his classmates and even tried to eat the duck, as foxes are prone to do. His behavior was so disruptive that he was expelled from school, he fell in with a rough crowd, and eventually wound up in a center for animal delinquents. The eagle was a problem child and disciplined severely. In the climbing class, he beat all the others to the top of the tree, but of course he used his own way to get there. <laughs> the elephant, meanwhile, developed low self-esteem because he couldn't do well in any of the subjects. When he sank into clinical depression, his therapist persuaded him to try a different school that focused on subjects such as lifting and carrying. Well, the elephant was disappointed because careers in lifting and carrying were not as prestigious as careers in flying, swimming, climbing, or running. Well, even though he always felt inferior, he did manage to make a decent living and support his family. So at the end of the year, an abnormal eel that could swim exceedingly well and run, climb, and fly just a little bit, had the highest average and was valedictorian. Meanwhile, the prairie dogs, which is an underground animal that we have in the U.S. that digs and lives underground, they stayed out of school and fought the tax levy because the administration would not add digging and burrowing to the curriculum. They apprenticed their children to a badger and later joined the groundhogs and the gophers to start a successful private school. Now, I, <laughs> we laugh at the funny story, right? The funny parable. Obviously, no such thing ever happened. But can you see the seriousness of this? Can you see the parallels? Can you see how crazy it is to apply the same test to all the animals? Has God made children just as diverse? How many of you have more than one child? Okay. Do you get them confused? Do you like, you see one in the kitchen one day, which child is this? <laughs> Likely not, <laughs> because they're all different, right? God has blessed uh, the human race with diversity. He values diversity. And if we want to put children through a system that teaches them all exactly the same thing and tests them all according to the same standard, we are going against the beautiful diversity that God has placed in, uh, in our children. It's really just as crazy as this animal story. Dr. David Elkin, who has his PhD in child development from Tufts University, he wrote a great book called The Hurried Child, and he, t he explains it very well as he says, the factory model of education ignores individual differences in learning, sorry, in mental abilities and learning rates and learning styles. 
Children are pressured to meet uniform standards as measured by the standardized test. Those who cannot keep up in the system, as indicated by the test, are often regarded as defective vessels and are labeled learning disabled or ADHD. We have a lot of labeling now going on in education, and it's not always accurate or helpful because from an early age, children are taught that they either know the answer or they don't, not that they can figure it out and be independent thinkers. Dr. Elkin continues to explain some of the problems with testing as he explains that schools have become increasingly industrialized and product-oriented, teachers are unionized, textbooks are standardized on a national level, and testing has become mechanized and all-pervasive as a consequence. Education is now reforming, which means more basics, more hours, more homework, more testing, more of everything that is creating the problem. It's a classic case of the cure being worse than the disease. It's a beautiful point he makes here. As we develop problems in education, we pile the children with more of what caused the problem to begin with. We need to take a step back and say, what are causing these problems? And of course, when it really boils down to thinking skills, here's where we get to the crux of the matter. Under these circumstances, children discover very quickly that passing tests rather than meaningful learning is what school is all about. Can you relate to this? <laughs> I certainly can. From my university time, uh, I, I got very good grades. I kept a 4.0 grade point average through university, and yet I learned very well that I could cram the night before, take the test in the morning, get an, a, a, an excellent grade, and an hour later forget everything that I put down. <laughs> had I really learned it? No. According to the results, the test results, I had done great, but I wasn't really learning. I learned that passing tests rather than meaningful learning is what school is all about. And it's not so much the children's fault as it is the school's fault for piling on so much work and so many tests that they don't have time for meaningful learning. And that's exactly what Dr. Carla Hannaford explains to us in her book called Smart Moves. There is no time or space to develop deep understanding of concepts, to test out new ideas through verbal and written action, or develop deductive reasoning skills. The memorizing necessary for these tests is a linear process that does not require entire brain use. Rote memory is a straight line process requiring none of the depth of understanding that comes from whole brain activation. In short, rote memory does not require thinking. Definitely, I, I mean, <laughs> if it doesn't require thinking, do you think it's helping encourage thinking? Definitely not. So why are we even testing? Why, why is this cycle continuing on? Doris Fromberg, who's Director of Early Childhood Teacher Education at Hofstra University, put it very well in a TED Talk she gave. She said, there is no evidence that standardized tests make a difference in learning. We've been testing kids long enough. We should know whether it's helping or it's not. Yes, we do know whether it's helping or it's not, and it's not helping. The research is very clear on that. So, who is benefiting from the testing? Why do we keep doing it? Large corporations and publishing companies. <laughs> they write the textbooks, they write the test, and they just have to keep the cycle going. Those are not my words. <laughs> I'm not being critical here. That's Doris Fromberg, um, a respected uh, researcher and educator. And she's saying, we just don't have the evidence that this is, is actually helping anyone. Um, the only body it's helping are the large corporations and publishing companies, not the children. Moving on, point number five, poor health and nutrition as an attack of Satan on good thinking skills. We know that what we eat and a good diet is critically important for children. But how much does health and nutrition relate to the going, growing mind? Very much. We know that myelin, which is an essential component of brain development, I'll get to more of that in the next session, it's made up of essential fatty acids, particularly those found in breast milk. Um, is that coincidental? That for infants, at a time when the brain is myelinating at an unprecedented rate, God placed the nutrients that they needed in breast milk. Uh, that, that's, that's evidence of a creator right there. We also know that green leafy vegetables, um, many things that we could go into, uh, really impact the development of the brain, really help it develop well. They did a study in New York of one million students, that's a massive research project, one million students, and they found that students who ate lunches that did not include artificial flavors, preservatives, and dyes did 14% better on IQ tests. 14%, that's a massive leap in IQ, simply by removing those additives from their diet. We also know that sugar 
is very damaging to the process of myelination and brain development. And again, we could spend an entire session on how the diet is impacting the brain. I think my mom will be getting more into that, and so I will leave that subject to her. But when it comes to Satan's attacks on thinking skills, he knows what he's doing here as he's damaging the diet of children. Point number six, age segregation. This is a relatively recent phenomenon that we have where what we now consider normal, that all the children and young, uh, yeah, all the children and young people are divided up into their separate classes by grade and age. Uh, that's not how it used to be. That is a relatively new development. As Dr. Jay Fieldman and Peter Gray, some top researchers in the field of age integration versus segregation. He tells us that the placement of children in separate classes with others of the same age is a fairly recent phenomenon. Age segregation did not occur in full force until the advent of compulsory education laws brought a large influx of children to the public school system. Until then, the main source of formal education for most children was the one-room schoolhouse, which on average contained approximately 25 children ranging in age from 5 to 15. So essentially what he's saying is that, you know, compulsory education laws come in, we have the massive influx of children to the school system, we have to organize them somehow. What's the logical way to organize children? By age. Yeah, and so they just made that decision, they organized them by age. But before that, it used to be that you had a small amount of children in the public school system, and so you, you just had all ages learning together. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Not all good things are bad. Just because this is a new development doesn't mean that it's um, good or bad. And so let's ask ourselves the question, is this helpful to learning? Uh, a, a very interesting insight here from the Journal of Social Issues tells us that never in history until the 20th century have young people been largely separated from the ongoing and productive activities of society. Interesting point here. We're separating children now from real life. Is that helping them develop good thinking skills? Quite possibly not. And in fact, continuing on in the same journal, society's survival depends on raising new generations in close proximity with adults who are engaged in their central roles. But institutional age segregation creates a situation in which parents' productive work, indeed major portions of their adult lives, are carried out in settings where there are no children. And children do not get to know a variety of adults and observe their lives. Is this helping prepare them for real life? Not really. As Dan Greenberg, who founded the Sudbury Valley School, which is an age-integrated school where children of various ages learn together, and he says, does such division take place naturally anywhere? In industry, do all 21-year-old laborers work separately from 20 years old or 23-year-olds? Obviously not. In business, are there separate rooms for 30-year-old executives and 31-year-old executives? Where on earth was this idea conceived? Is anything more socially damaging than segregating children by year for 14 or often 18 years? What's the reason he gives here? socially damaging? What's the number one reason given in favor of age segregation as we know it? Social development, right? Children need to be with other children for proper social development. That's what we hear all the time. Uh, why is he saying that it's socially damaging? Well, let's see. Let, let's, let's get to that in just a moment. Let's first understand what's known as the zone of proximal development. This zone is defined as tasks that a child can accomplish only with some assistance and support. Most cognitive development, cognitive development in the research is often referring to, to learning, uh, uh, mental development. Most learning takes place in this zone of proximal development. <clears throat> what is this zone? Children develop primarily by attempting tasks they can accomplish only in collaboration with a more competent individual. The zone of proximal development is an activity or a task that a child can accomplish only if they're working with someone who is more competent than they. Let's see this from a simple example. Anyone ever seen two uh, three-year-olds playing a game of catch with a ball? Two three-year-olds. <laughs> You're smiling. <laughs> How long did it last? <laughs> Very short. <laughs> a couple of tosses, if that. Why? Well, they're not coordinated enough yet to play an accurate game of catch. But suppose we take, uh, let's say, a 10-year-old and a three-year-old. Can they now play a game of catch? Absolutely. That 10-year-old can carefully throw the ball into the outstretched arms of the 3-year-old, and when the 3-year-old makes a crazy throw back the other direction, the 10-year-old runs and catches it. 
that game of catch became within the zone of proximal development because it was the task that this three-year-old could accomplish only in collaboration with the more competent individual, in this case, the 10-year-old. Does that make sense? All right, so for this reason, when it comes to age integration, we find benefits in the area of academics. Children actually learn better in an age-integrated environment. And let me just clarify, it's, it's not just age integration for young people. And this can be age integration for the family, right? I mean, that's true age integration, where you have everyone from the grandparents down to the little babies. That's true age integration as God has designed it. Benefits with academics, benefits with self-esteem. Um, and, and that's a good thing. I realize self-esteem uh, from a Christian perspective can, can be a bit a negative thing. We don't want to have high self-esteem and pride and such. In the research, when we see self-esteem, that's often just referring to their sense of self-worth. They understand that they're a valuable individual who, um, who can contribute in a positive way to society. And how is age integration helping self-esteem? Uh, we don't really know for sure from the research, but we just see the results of it. And I would have to think, though, that the peer influence of an age-segregating environment is quite damaging to self-esteem uh, often. But most interestingly, socialization skills. We actually find that children in age-integrated environments, that's all ages together, have better social skills than those in age-segregated environments. Why? <clears throat> the results seem to show that a child's social development depends more on adult contact and less on children uh, sorry, less on contact with other children as previously thought. In other words, we, and this is Dr. Larry Shires, who's done extensive research on socialization, comparing um, various classes of children, the homeschooled all the way to the standard public school and private school and different ages and, and different schools, and uh, some very interesting research that he brings out. And basically, he summarizes it, and it's just saying that we used to think that children had to be with other children for proper socialization. That was the assumption. But we now know from the research that that assumption was not correct. It depends more on adult contact. Why? Let's just think about that logically. Are we training children to remain as children or to grow up to be adults? To grow up. Thank you. We want them to grow up to be adults. A friend of mine who's an educator, I was talking with him about this recently, and he said, look, if we're training our children to be adults, uh, children really don't learn how to be adults from other children they learn from adults. <laughs> and I had to sit there and scratch my head. Yeah, you're right, I said. We don't think about that often, but if we want to prepare children for adulthood, well, they're going to need to be around other adults who teach them about being an adult. That's just common sense, and that's how we're building um, social development. They need to know how to talk and interact and communicate with adults in the real world. And of course, when it comes to learning, when you're little and just with kids your own age, the range of possible activities is restricted by the knowledge and abilities of those in your age group. But in collaboration with older kids, there's almost no limit to what you might do. Great connection there with how they can just continue to advance within their own abilities rather than being stuck within the grade level that they're being placed in. And of course, a close study of what big people were up to was always the most exciting occupation of youth. Was it not? Isn't that how it used to be? You just couldn't wait to see what the big people, was it grandpa or, or, or dad or whoever it was in your family that you loved and appreciated, you wanted to see what they were up to, but we've lost that now with the age-segregated, media-saturated culture that we now live in. And of course, God is a lover of diversity, as I mentioned earlier. God created the family as an age-integrated environment. He did not make families uh, you know, that's the 12-year-old family, and that's the 40-year-old the family. <laughs> no, there are blended ages. God made it that way. That was his perfect plan. Point number seven, I'm not going to spend much time on this, and that is television and electronics. The reason I'm skipping over this, though, is um, tomorrow, I don't remember the time, sorry. A couple sessions from now, we're going to cover an overview of my new series called I Child, and we're going to look very in-depth at how media and electronics are impacting children's brains. So we're just going to skip right through this section because we're going to get to all of that later. We know, though, that media in all its forms is very damaging to the developing brain. It is very damaging to thinking skills and independent thinking skills. And we saw that the more quiet and simple the life of the child, the more free from artificial excitement, which media would definitely fall into, and the more in harmony with nature, the more favorable it is to physical and mental vigor and spiritual strength. Media is 
incredibly damaging. And again, I have a new series called iChild. You're welcome to purchase those DVDs on the resource table back there or go to my website at A Thinking Generation. But we're going to cover that in an overview session in a couple of sessions. So let's now move on to point number eight. And that is an education chiefly of the mind. Education chiefly of the mind. It's an ironic reality that an education which just focuses on mental skills, linear thinking, book learning, as we often refer it to, other purely mental culture, soon causes the mind to lose the capability of true good thinking skills. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I, I mentioned earlier, we know that true education must involve the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. But so much education nowadays is purely focusing on the mental. We need a balance of all three. The reason for that is good thinking skills require the whole brain. We need our whole brain to be able to imagine and to think and to process things clearly. We can't just have one area of the brain developed. Have any of you ever broken a limb, an arm or a leg? All right, a few of you. Uh, so I don't know how long you were not able to use that limb, but I can imagine that you probably lost some muscle, right, during the time that it healed. I certainly experienced that recently with breaking this leg. I went six months with no weight bearing. What do you think those muscles look like at the end of six months? <laughs> Not much there. Atrophied. Uh, so I actually went, I was at this in the office, at the surgeon's office, and he said, yeah, you know, I think it's healed enough. Go ahead and start putting some weight down. And he said, why, why don't you get up and, and see what you can do? And I looked at him like, are you crazy? Uh, he said, no, just try it. And, <laughs> you know, so I got out. He said, just use one crutch. And I said, I can't do this. I can't put weight up. And, but I tried to take a step, and it just crumpled. You know, I, I could not hold it up. Nothing there. And so that's a beautiful analogy, though, of what happens in the brain. If we imagine the brain as a muscle, and we're only working one area of the brain with this constant mental effort, study, 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 we're working this one area of the brain, but we're forgetting about the other areas that are involved when we do the physical activity or the Bible study that helps develop, develop the whole brain. And so pretty soon, just like I couldn't walk, I couldn't involve my whole body in walking, we can't involve the whole brain in thinking if one area has become shriveled through underuse. An education derived chiefly from books leads to superficial thinking. Practical work encourages close observation and independent thought. Is there anything wrong with books? No, no we need books. But if that's the only place we're getting the education from, it's leading to superficial thinking because we're just working one area of the brain and we're allowing the others to dwindle. Rightly performed practical work tends to develop that practical wisdom which we call common sense. It develops the ability to plan and execute, strengthens the courage and perseverance, and calls for the exercise of tact and skill. We've been given a plan by the Lord for physical, mental, and spiritual. I, I, I'm not getting into the Bible study right now, but we also know that that is powerful for developing the brain, and I'll touch more on that in a later session also. Point number nine, our last Sorry, no, we have 10, 10 tactics. This is the last one we're going to cover this morning, though, and that is a lack of training to think. We need to allow children a chance to figure things out for themselves. Now, not always by themselves. Children need the encouragement and support of the adults, but when possible, allow them to explore and develop on their own because this is going to challenge their thinking abilities. Let them learn by exploring, and of course, allowing them to make some minor mistakes is going to really help with the thinking abilities. As they make a minor mistake, they'll learn from it much better than if you had just told them, oh, don't do that, or you'll make a mistake. <laughs> Um, and obviously, you have to draw the line and not let them make mistakes that will, um, you know, be very, very damaging. But some minor mistakes really help develop what is known as cause-to-effect reasoning. I make this decision, I get this result. That's a natural cause-to-effect response that is very important for children and adults to have. Point number 10, tactic number 10, Satan's thought-destroying tactics. This one is quite damaging. It causes an inability to think formally, a disorganization of the brain, learned helplessness, learning disabilities, eye problems, school burnout, school dropout, a lack of spirituality, a major cause of our young people leaving the church, a major cause of a lack of thinking skills. What is this tactic? I'll tell you tomorrow. But I want to wrap up with an important point for us to keep in mind, both in this session and throughout this weekend with all of the material that we're going to look at. 
It is very easy as we look at these tactics, these attacks on, of Satan on the mind, to start pointing fingers and say, wow, the educational system is getting so bad. Or, wow, look at how bad society is getting. Look how damaging media is. When we need to be careful about pointing fingers and realize that we are often the ones, as families, who can actually do something about it. We likely can't, you know, don't have the privilege of becoming the minister of education for the country and changing the school system. <laughs> but we can change the environment for our children in our families. In fact, we're told that the position of a parent is one of the most responsible on earth, yet it is far too lightly regarded by the majority of the world. The future of the rising generation is in the hands of parents, for in a great measure, they hold within their control the destiny of their children, both for time and for eternity. The salvation of the young depends almost wholly upon the training they receive in childhood. What an incredible responsibility. What a position of change and influence. Rather than pointing fingers and talking about how all the system is doing it wrong, let's change the system that we can change, and that is within our families, because this is the most responsible on earth. The future of the rising generation is within our hands, because we hold the control of the destiny of our children for time and for eternity. How incredibly powerful. Will we accept our responsibility? <clears throat> Never before was there so much at stake. Never were there results so mighty, depending upon a generation as upon these now coming upon this stage of action. We need a generation to finish the work on this earth. How many of you believe Jesus is coming soon? Okay, great. But how many of you believe that we have a work to do to enable Jesus to come soon? You see, we forget about that often. Oh, Jesus is coming soon, I can't wait. And he says, go preach the gospel and then the end will come. We have a job to do, a mission to accomplish. Meanwhile, Satan has pulled off so many distractions, so many tactics to stop the development of the generation that will finish the work. We need this generation. How will we obtain it? With our schools and society and media attacking children with everything it has? It will take us as families and as, as teachers. If you're a teacher, do we have any teachers, by the way? All right, one, great. No other teachers. Ugh. We need more good teachers because they have such a powerful influence over their children in the schools. Of course, if you are a mother, you are a teacher too. And the family is the greatest educational center that God has ever designed. In closing, a famous quote we know well, but so very important for our last days, and we talk about thinking. The greatest want of the world is the want of men, men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pull, and men who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. This will be the final generation. How will this be obtained? Are these is this generation of men those who just do whatever the media is telling them to do? Those who just reflect what someone else has thought for them already? Those who are downloading someone else's thoughts as we started off with? No, this generation of men are those who are thinkers, clear thinkers, who understand the Word of God, who base their beliefs on the Word of God, and who stand for the right, though the heavens fall. Remember, it's true education to train thinkers and not mere reflectors of other men's thoughts. Let us take part in this last generation. Let us have a thinking generation and fight against Satan's plan to prevent it. Amen. Will you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, thank you for the calling you've given us to finish your work, for the explanation you've given us that we need thinkers, and for the warnings you've given us that Satan will do all he can to destroy this generation. We thank you, Lord, though, for the research now that we have, the modern science that makes it so clear to us what the devil's up to. And I just pray, Lord, for each family here, uh, teachers, schools, wherever they may be, Lord, give them the courage to stand for you to help raise this final generation upon the earth. We want to go home, Lord. Please enable us to do your work so that you can come. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen.